Why are we always so much uh, driven by growth and in which way this will possibly uh, change considering the fact that now we have an increased variability in the world. So to give you a sense, is the first video I'm going to show you. which is uh, what type of world do we have, what happens if we now cannot really see between the white spaces. So start with uh, obsession with growth. We have noticed more and more the fact that uh, more and more companies are trying to expand their growth. Uh, they find it difficult to find growth in the traditional sense, uh, primarily because at the macroeconomic level we've been going into uh, some sort of chronic recession now for five, quite a few years. Both uh, faulty macroeconomic policy that don't really help. Uh, at the same time, the fact that so many players, uh, the implosion of startup that can kind of happen at the grassroots level, they never really become major uh, conglomerates. And so how do we find growth when now the traditional macroeconomic uh, metrics, they tend to be limited. So that was the original assumption that really drove us to uh, think about an alternative way to think about growth. And back in 2013, uh, Terence and I and uh, Professor Sufani, who some of you have met yesterday uh, when he was introduced in the circular economy, we, uh, we thought about the fact that if we are able to tap on measuring this fastest spending market, uh, we might be able to find growth, which is kind of flip from the traditional way of measuring. Uh, growth and interesting about that we found that there is always a strong correlation between social drivers and economic growth but social drivers are not easy to find in, in conventional sense so we started to think maybe we have to really look whether there are any social drivers that really can inspire us to understand where we're heading as a society so from here we start to look at the fact that in terms of growth uh, we were looking at uh, a unique historical time uh, because uh, if you're looking at the aggregate GDP from uh, this slide onwards, you notice that there has been very, very controlled growth. Each one of these, of course, they are overlapping important historical events. Uh, and if you're looking at the size of the economy today, it's uh, almost disproportional. And so, interesting, we are living in the most abundant era of capital in the world. Converted, of course, by the number of people who are in the world. 
Uh, but sometimes we have this impression that there is not enough resources, that we are increasing the gap between those who have and those who don't have. So we were kind of puzzled about all of this information. It looked like, yes, it's great. We have never had so much aggregation than now. We have never had so much uh, uh, GDP than now. Uh, but we don't have a proper uh, distribution. And so we started to understand what is happening and in which way can we possibly try to map the changes. So we started with uh, what has really inspired the work of the book, which is called Drive. So Drive is a framework that we design, uh, trying to bear in mind five main ideas. The first one, how we're changing our society and in which way our society is becoming different from before. Just to give you a teaser on that, um, for most of, of modern history, uh, we have always been organized by population pyramids, where kids are the largest part of the population segment, and as we get older, we get, of course, uh, reduced in numbers. And this is one of the first time in history where we're no longer going to have the luck of having kids as the larger part of our population, but we now have equal numbers in many ways, and especially depending if you guys are going to narrow it down to countries between kids and other segments. And in some cases, of course, the uh, rising segment of the population are the 60 and plus, and I'm going to be able to show you this in a visual representation. Now, from understanding where people, how people are becoming, where they're living, and the fact that many of them are shifting to cities, we also have to talk about resources. In the book, this is where we also talk about circular economy. Uh, this is when we think that circular economy can really help in trying to optimize some of these uh, flaws in the resource, uh, resource scarcity. We argue that we are somehow taking for granted access to resources that are not for granted, and one of the main examples is water, and we'll try to tell you more about this. Um, in our presentation, but of course we're trying to really engage with this conversation. How can we run uh, our system forward with abundance if our resources are becoming scarce? This is an important part of the work. This is when we start noticing increasing gap between those who have and those who don't have. Uh, I think you don't hear it from me only that we're living in unprecedented times in terms of inequalities. We have intentionally decided to have a plural form because we think it's not all about capital or, inc or, or uh, income. It's way more distributed uh, from healthcare to gender equity, uh, just to name you some. The part that is probably the part most exciting for us, which is where in the book we call harnessing hope, is the one starting with V. Uh, that's when we're looking at volatility, scale, complexity, everything that defined the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence, blockchain, they are to some extent byproduct of this entirely new reconfiguration of the world. And this is when we are seeing a lot of opportunity for a redefining of the, the guiding principle how the world works. Uh, Josh will probably take you through this today, but when you're looking at the fourth industrial revolution as a reconsideration of what's the purpose of life, what's the purpose of planet, what's the purpose of the work or jobs, we kind of really embody itself a lot into uh, the V. And finally, with the E, we were looking at the enterprise and dynamic, this, this pulse of uh, uh, innovation coming from part of the world where we usually did not expect innovation. So clearly the usual suspects are China and India in our conversation. They now are rising and becoming innovation hubs. But the conversation goes into how innovation has shifted from tech, which the four was prohibited by the cost, to simply smart innovation, innovation that is addressing an important problem. So, Everything related from the frugal innovation or the jugad innovation, all the way down to how China is innovating at a pace we would never imagine. But the same happened if you travel to Southeast Asia, and you notice how some of this economy are becoming very digital. Or if you guys go to Rwanda or Kenya or to uh, uh, Ghana or, or Nigeria, where the internet penetration is rising, where the infrastructure is improving, and at the same time, their ability to innovate is increasing with it. And so we are redefining world equilibria by looking at innovation as a, as a distributive benefit rather than only in the hands of very few people. That's in a nutshell drive, so it really is a, is a comprehensive effort from our side, but is non-exhaustive by nature, of understanding how the future can possibly look like, and is only a proxy to start the reflection, it's not meant to be anything else than getting people to start thinking a more structured way how the future can possibly look like. To carry on with this, uh, show you really some of the uh, groundbreaking findings that we actually 
discovered. So this is growth popula global population by global uh, broad group. This is a, a simulation 2000, 2050. You know this already by the way this is uh, uh, represented that we have predominance in this group of people. Uh, but when you're looking at uh, uh, kids, up to, well, kids and youth up to 24, uh, they were still to some extent a bit more. Um, and now this is the simulation going to 2050. Uh, you notice that we will clearly have one winner, which is the group 25 and 59. But you also notice how significant the group 60 and plus has really grown as well. So how will we redesign our social compacts considering that this is not the original premise of our society. This is not how pensions are calculated. This is not how our healthcare system is designed to function. Bear in mind that Social Security in the US was introduced when life expectancy was at the age of 63. So clearly, now we're longer. We have removed some of the major stressors that were actually imposing or inferring mortality. So how do we deal with the fact that we are changing the DNA of our society? So that's one of the first conversation, if we are able to uh, upgrade our software to this, we might be able to redesign socioeconomic structure accordingly, which is where the opportunity rises. At the same time, where will this group of people end up living? Uh, well, the answer is, uh, this is an example of a country with a, a population that's getting old. So clearly Japan, Italy, Germany, and Spain are going to be at the forefront of the wave that will happen when population is becoming very old. We think Japan stands a chance in understanding how to manage the complexity because of their innovation outputs and package in the culture. We struggle to think that the same will happen with, with liberty and ease in countries like uh, Germany, where their, their benefit stock is now slowly depleting and the population is becoming older without too much investment. And hopefully the southern economy, uh, they stand a chance to reposition themselves in the, in the marketplace by understanding how to place this, this rising concern. Uh, where will they leave? Uh, urbanization. So these are some of the problems that we think will come with this. And with every problem, we're all, all opportunities. Uh, you notice that waste is at the center of our attention. So you can see the linkage between what you have done yesterday and what we're doing today. So we're not discounting circularity. We think it's part of understanding how to improve and optimize uh, processes of production. Uh, so we consider that if we're not addressing the issue, this could become uh, really bad for the global society. To give you a sense of this urbanization by taking and cherry picking a country that we tend to study more and more these days, I uh, would like to show you a map of China. This is their expected urbanization rate by 2030, um, divided by three colors, uh, and every color is defining their current rate of urbanization. You notice that the red one are 80% uh, of above. Uh, then you have a number which are between 50 and 79. And the dark blue is below 50%. So a lot of this city will grow in size. Uh, they will create uh, opportunity. They will probably be aggregate GDP. But we will also implode some of the resources. And you notice there is uh, still expansion from the coastal east to what could be actually the expansion of the Chinese economy to the West, that will not come without strings attached. At the same time, in the research, we found out that if you have to look at where are the rising new cities that will create more economic power, 70 to 80 percent of those cities, what we call the middleweight performers, are somehow in China. So there is nothing that will actually prevent China to reaffirm and confirm its role of having become the new epicenter of the global world interests. Uh, I think we start feeling in the West how the North Atlantic uh, equilibrium has already shifted and we're now becoming secondary to some of the um, some of the main global movements that we see primarily shift into Asia. Uh, going into R so that I can take you um, quickly to a part that is interesting which is the V and the E. Uh, again conversation on resources we're not going to go over too many details just for you to see one of the, our core concern is water uh, this is again uh, one of the possible uh, uh, projections about water consumption in the next few years. Uh, you see divided by economic groups. Uh, so BRICS with Indonesia as part of this, rest of the world, and because water is uh, one major global resource, of course we have to consider the, the planetary resources. So what's the demand looking like in the next few years? 
Clearly, the world as a whole will have an increase of about 37%. If you're asking yourself the question, do we have currently that amount of water? Clearly, we don't. So how do we innovate in water? How do we optimize water flows? How do we are preserving and conserving water? How do we become smarter in investing in water? It's important. Bear in mind how water is choric and centric to so many different things like irrigation, of course, agriculture, uh, cattle, food. And so just to give you a sense, if we are uh, unattentive to this conversation, the price of food could actually go through the roof uh, if we're becoming uh, less and less exposed to scarcity of water. Uh, in one specific study that we cite in the report, uh, China would be the country with the highest exposure with about 229% more cost of food than now, which means that you will create a lever of inequality of an unprecedented nature. I also remind all of us, the food has always been historically one of the triggers for major mass demonstration or revolts. Even the Great Depression in America in 19, 1929 was driven somehow by the rising price of wheat. And so we should never forget the fact that food and, and agriculture, they're much more important in terms of the social uh, drivers than what we think. Uh, from here, uh, of course, the conversation on climate change. Again, this is our scenario we would never like to see. We currently are at 1.5 degree warmer than what we consider to be the average um, for whatever normalcy we consider. Now, this is a simulation from Parakana, who is a scholar who studies uh, geostrategy. Whatever is in blue will actually be able to tilt to prosper. Whatever is in red will have significant and massive uh, disruption. Uh, it can be floods, it can be inhabitable land, it can be desertification, it can also be um, inability to grow food, so inerable, so we can grow food. You know that there is a, an intimate relationship between population migration and where we can grow food, so clearly this will become a, a scenario we will never probably be able to manage, so hopefully it will never happen. From here we go into inequality, briefly on this, uh, we talk about clearly uh, what is an, uh, on conversation on a daily basis, uh, the rich versus the poor. This part uh, is uh, it's increasing. We clearly have to understand why more than describing factually what's happening. Um, this is a kind of uh, uh, easy way to represent the, the uh, epidemic we really have in terms of rich versus poor. Now we're talking about about 0.1%. Uh, equalizing or equating the same wealth of the 90, bottom 90 percent. So it's numbers that we have never really seen before in history. Uh, but where we think this conversation really has uh, its genesis is in what we think has been the ongoing digitalization that has really increased corporate profits uh, on, uh, this is of course extracted from one of the main articles from, uh, from Harvard Business Review called The Great Decoupling, and wages as a percent of GDP have also decreased. And so that specific fork is something we should not see. Uh, there is always a, uh, the assumption that growth is proportional, so everybody should actually win. So if there's more corporate profit in the system, we should have some degree of redistribution of the profit across, but of course this is not happening. And one of the answer to why is because we have digitalized, so we don't require as many people as before. But clearly, you can improve uh, the benefit for whoever owns the assets, but that does not need to have employ as many people as before. So the whole conversation about automation, robotics, of course, is important. We have to place it with, uh, with, with uh, more of a, a, an impartial view uh, rather than just criminalizing the idea, because for all of history, we have always seen uh, people becoming redundant in the face of automation. I think this time is a little bit different because of the pace, the, the, the aggressive nature of replacement of labor or displacement of labor, and the fact that we have in technology like AI that is able to do um, something that we never really had done before. And so matching this with, of course, this other graph, um, the great decoupling, labor productivity, and real GDP, private employment, and median family income, you notice that we were actually growing in par for a large part of our, after World War II. This is, by the way, the golden age of the American economy. This is when America became the country that became the proponent of the New World Order. Uh, this is when Europe was uh, waking up to the idea of rebuilding, uh, trying to go into commerce, moving away from their agrarian nature, and so on and so forth. Um, and clearly, for a number of reasons, from the 80 onwards, both from uh, Washington consensus, macroeconomic policy that tried to deregulate markets, 
uh, all the way down to uh, the banking reform, fractional banking, the junk bonds, the idea of borrowing our prosperity from the future, and all of this, uh, little by little, digitalization, automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, they all come together to really show a clear gap between labor productivity and family income. Uh, so how can they still afford to actually experience a really decent standard of living? Of course, debt is one of the problems which is depleting some of the ability for our, our, our uh, society to uh, build a future. So you can see this also in drop in investment, savings going down. So there is a number of different conversations to be made on this. And this could be an entire class, right? And that's what we do when we're teaching courses like this. But for you to see where the conversation really has shape, shaped up and where it has taken us as we're going into the other direction. So DR and I, they really define this major trajectory that if you want to change the future, you really have to start acting now. In the book, we introduce in beside the framework, something called present casting. So we try to play in contrast with backcasting and forecasting and thinking about understanding what happens now so we can change it. Um, and that's where we think there is a bit of aspiration in the book by thinking you want to become the architect of the future, then change it now, rather than expecting the future to unfold. Now, again, life expectancy, same story, sick care versus well care conversation, who will be able to afford more preventative care, or clearly people with more money, and who actually pays the most when uh, they can't afford it. There are people that have to go to the hospital and get into critical care. So there is, of course, a very unfortunate intimate relationship between financial exposure and health care. In some countries, it's more than others. Uh, but it shows you that if we're not fixing this, we're going to get to the point in which aging population, on one hand, the fact that we're creating more and more in uh, inequality, at the socioeconomic level, it will also impact health care. You can imagine the public debt will go with, grow with it, and so on and so forth. From DRNI, we package this conversation into the part that really kind of uh, give the, the tone to our conference today is the V and the E. So in V and E, uh, we find it uh, uh, fascinating to notice that most of our financial and economic measures, they tend to be inadequate to forecast really the degree of complexity of our economies. So we start with uh, uh, understanding, first of all, our forecast of future jobs. This is becoming more and more uh, a relevant conversation. Uh, the World Economic Forum is, is investing uh, resources in understanding the future of work. Um, so jobs that are uh, possibly uh, keen on disappearing uh, because of the fact that we're changing the nature of labor in general to job that might possibly become, I don't know, possibly outlining or rising or landscaping. Clearly, it's a fact that the number of jobs that we create is less than the number of jobs we currently displace. Uh, you can argue it's a temporary transition. We don't know. Uh, we hope it's uh, a transition that will possibly entice organizations to create new jobs. Uh, but by itself is not a perfect, it's not a zero-sum game anymore, right? So we are actually really not winning in the creation of job. We are creating job, but not at the pace in the one that we're losing. Um, most of our ability to forecast the, the future according to traditional financial and economic measure is uh, being compromised by the fact that we hardly can normalize. Uh, this is uh, one of the examples we always take. I'll let you read it by yourself. Uh, so a swing of more than 10% a day for the Dow Jones uh, should happen only 300,000 years according to how the theory was originally hypothesized, but in the 20th century it actually happened 48 times. It shows you how much of uh, uh, outlier, an outlier society we have become, in which the outlier, they outnumber the actually standard distribution, to the point in which we hardly know what can happen tomorrow by simply looking at the past, because the, any sort of like effort to try to forecast the future by linearizing the past is, of course, bias by its own attempt, considering the fact that the future happened with a degree of interfacing of variable that we had never seen before. And there are many examples. I, I really want just for you to, uh, to feel excited about the opportunity of studying this, researching this, and redefining them at the same time, rather than simply surrendering to this. Uh, finally, AI. This is a slide you were looking for in uh, Thailand. Yeah, <laughs> we were in Thailand and Terence were looking for this slide, but it, I saw it, but it didn't, so anyway. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, becoming more and more intelligence. Um, I'll let Danny tell you more about AI. This was a specific exercise on Facebook-like 
using uh, a renowned organizational behavior uh, uh, framework called the, uh, the, the Big Five, I think, something like this. Um, it shows you the level of accuracy of, uh, of AI. So you know this AI is a thing here. And with the exception of your spouse, uh, it tends to perform better than anyone else actually knows you. So the ability for AI to become more accurate than human is clearly a given. So what happens, and this is where I think there is a conversation that opens a Pandora box, when this can possibly shape self-determination, when the machine can make decisions that are factually better than what we can make, but then how do we define the ethical code? You know, how do we define the, the right space for this to become uh, a support rather than a prescription or normative? But, you know, again, AI is really where we're going to dedicate a significant part of our time. Uh, finally, enterprise and dynamics, uh, where most of innovation is coming from in the specific angle of my presentation. Uh, so going back to drive, we think that if you're looking at the traditional way for organization to innovate, uh, customer efficiency, engineering, science base, it would be interesting to see and compare uh, how the US and China perform because clearly if I told you five or ten years ago that China is an innovation country you would look at me with some uh, concern and if we're putting them into uh, uh, a specific graph that looks like this you notice the four different uh, innovations uh, within this uh, spectrum um, this is the US clearly performing very well in a number of different field and this is China uh, not looking bad for a country that historically was not supposed to be an innovation champion. And now in some category, China is by itself. There is no one behind. Uh, so commercial drones, as you guys know, China is, is, uh, is uh, topping the chart. Solar panels. Uh, so you could imagine with the day the country is ready to even think about internal demand. Uh, they have the production. Uh, household appliances and the railroads. Many of the driverless metro that we drive in European city might be manufactured in China. And so really this kind of uh, gives you a sense how the, the world has really become a different place from when we were born in many ways, right? When we still had a clear understanding of the world order and uh, at the same time uh, rising shift towards an uh, entirely different redefinition of our uh, societal uh, values. Um, the opportunity, of course, we argue that when you're able to uh, uh, understand the mega trends, you can also convert them into opportunity for growth. Uh, so this is a part of the presentation that we usually do when we are trying to tell uh, our audience that growth is somehow strongly uh, related to the ability to understand mega trends. So we argue that if you are able to come up with proxies, I'm going to show you just some that we do ourselves. Uh, so this is just uh, for you to see. We think drive is at the top, is a macroeconomic, uh, or is a macro instrument to detect trends. Um, we think that if you are able to find proxies, like the one that we are is describing here, but these are really just for the sake of illustration, there can be many more, you can find a way to link the macro to the micro by generating filters they help you narrow it down from extremely complex information down to the things that matters to you, all the way down to uh, minimal viable product, beta, uh, business model, so what you tend to do in strategy, where you're trying to test an idea, right? We argue the idea should not come from the inside out, which is really the mystique that we used to have for a long period of time, but you should get inspired by what happened outside in understanding how the world around you, what, you, what we used to call one time the external, uh, the, the, neg the negative externalities, the world around you can really inspire your business model. In this way, there is no barrier of entry to the point in which anyone can realize of a major dormant demand and deliver to this. So we have, in this sense, given much more access to, uh, uh, to anyone to participate to the global economy simply by understanding, looking, and trying to engage to the type of world we have become. Really, this kind of closes the conversation on drive, understanding how the future unfolds. Uh, the book uh, that we will be uh, signing with Terence later on, a journey that we started in 2015, but we also is a journey that really has opened us to everything that will follow later on. So it's in the V that we have really discovered more and more uh, 
uh, an area we wanted to study. So our next book, which is currently in production uh, with uh, actually Terence Denny uh, Hajime, who is our chief AI scientist and myself, is going to be about artificial intelligence. We think there is a space for us to tell a story on what we think, and that really came from being inspired to what we discover in the V. We really set the tone of everything that will happen this morning, all the way down to Josh with the fourth industrial revolution. So hopefully that has given you an overview on why we think this matters and, and sets the tone for a conversation. Uh, so that's pretty much everything I want to say from my side. So thank you very much for this. <laughs>